Okay. I was told that I only have 30 minutes and that we shouldn't exceed the limit by uh, well, too much. Very well, very well. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Michael Buban and uh, I've been teaching uh, at the School of Missions and Theology in the Kalin Czech Republic. Uh, in the first place, I want to thank you for actually being here. Uh, if you are feeling bad that we are three teachers or professors uh, speaking to three students, uh, this, is still, this is still very fine with me. I mean, I'm used to much um, humble conditions. My gratitude also belongs to the Department of Theology and Christian Education here in Banska Bystrica. Thank you for inviting me and uh, I'm very, very honored and pleased and happy. Uh, I've joyfully accepted this invitation, although it was a little bit of short note for me, uh, short notice for me. Uh, thank you anyway. My paper uh, is focused on Amos Young's pneumatic imagination. Now, Amos Young is perhaps one of the most prolific Pentecostal academic theologians of all time. Not that there would be too many academic Pentecostal theologians now or in history, uh, but it should be noted that Amos Young is uh, definitely one of the most pro prolific one of us. His theological work is not only voluminous, but also wide-ranging. His focus spans from theology of religions to disability studies, from dialogue with sciences, to his recent contribution to theological interpretation of the Book of Revelation. However, I mean to make a point in what follows, uh, that despite its breadth uh, and depth, Young's work is extremely compact and can be explained as best and best understood in the light of his early work in philosophical theology, which has led him to design the so-called pneumatological imagination. I will also argue that no matter how non-conformist or revisionist uh, may Young's work appear to more conservative circles in Pentecostal and evangelical theology, it is best understood as an attempt in consequential Pentecostal public theology which enables Pentecostal experience and Pentecostal piety to meaningfully dialogue with the wider public marketplace of thought, including other religions and natural science, sciences. The starting point of Young's contribution is turn to pneumatology in theology of knowledge, which begins with appreciation and critical adoption of the, con of the concept of foundational pneumatology that was originally devised by a Jesuit systematic theologian, Donald Jalpin. In his book, uh, The Divine Mother, a Trinitarian Theology of the Holy Spirit, Jalpin attempts to develop a descriptive normative account of pneumatic experience with focal point as the event of conversion, which provides metrics that validates all theologizing. In Jalpin's foundational pneumatology, conversion is the process that shapes the reflective capacities of all human beings. Jalpe thus presents a high view of experience in general and of religious experience in particular and of this particular Christian conversion experience. This experience sustains being and knowing itself as its very foundation. Jung applauds and highly appreciates the, uh, this move and affirms many aspects in Jalpe's account of conversion. But he questions one thing. He questions the propriety of insisting on Christian conversion as a prerequisite for pneumatological understanding. Experience for Jung can stand for an epistemic foundation, just as with Jalpe but only because it captures the footprint of God relating to humans and humans to God and thus upholds the foundation that is public and universal rather than accounting only for the human experience of God. So what experience would Jung rather choose if not Christian conversion? Christian conversion, after all, is the focal point of Christian existence as such. 
Young heralds that a better strategy for foundational pneumatology would be to focus on the entirety of the epistemological and experiential spectrum of the human being in the world, rather than on the methodological and functional role of specific experiences. This is what he says, but what I actually think that he means uh, is that, as we shall see, uh, he in fact uh, builds upon the specific Pentecostal charismatic experience of the spirit which perhaps incidentally replaced the experience of conversion, the Christological experience, Christocentric experience, in Jalpe's original mode. Uh, how does Jung do it? He actually does it in a series of intricate steps. In his development of pneumatological uh, epistemology, Jung assumes that just as we cannot access any epistemic knowledge of God apart from creation, so can we not access any knowledge of creation apart from God. He is aided here with, um, with uh, theology of his doctor father, uh, Robert Cummings Neville, and we don't have time to really delve into that, but uh, this is what he, uh, what he says. To elaborate this point, Jung builds on the semiotic metaphysics of Charles Sanders Peirce, whom he recognizes as one of the, pre the preeminent thinkers in American history. Now, Peirce tries to explain a reality uh, of creation uh, as a continuum of three elemental modes. Firstness is a pure possibility of all things. It is thisness of anything. Uh, firstness is when God says to Moses, I am who I am. I am simply what I am. Then secondness is the decisive concreteness of one thing against another. And thirdness is that which mediates between them. Thirdness is interpretation, which makes meaningful secondnesses, otherness over against firstness. All these three elemental modes of all things operate at once, but firstness is never approachable in experience, only as secondness that is interpreted by thirdness, which is therefore as a mediation dependent on firstness through secondness. Now, Jung takes this philosophical concept of, of semiotic metaphysics and applies this triadic structure, triadic scheme, on theology of creation. Father is unapproachable firstness that reveals itself to created order as son in a secondness that is communicated and interpreted through thirdness, the Holy Spirit. Apart from Logos, from Christ, Jung says, the Spirit is impotent and empty. Apart from the Spirit, he adds, the Word, Christ, remains indeterminate. This, of course, has a significant implication. Just like with Pierce and Jelpe, and it must be noted here that Jelpe also builds on Pierce's uh, philosophy, draws, draws on him heavily as well. Uh, just like with Pierce and Jelpe, it is not just religious experience, but all human experience which Jung understands as mediatedness that is essentially of the spirit. It is all human experience. For Jung, our experience of God is not qualitatively different from our experience of anything else. It is not qualitatively different from our experience of anything else. Experience of God himself is only different because it relates to us a dimension of being that includes, but is not exhausted by normal experience. Okay. Let me turn the page. As thirdness, the spirit is the divine wisdom which enables the very notion of semiotics. Creative word of God is uttered through spirit's presence. This presence is both the source of rationality and the mediator or communicator of rationality. The spirit is both that which mediates all creation and that which gives it understanding. Or, in more precise words, 
The spirit is the universal presence and activity of God that permeates both the external structures of the natural and human world and the internal realms of a human heart. Pierce's semiotic metaphysics thus serves to Young's foundational pneumatology as a necessary toolkit because it provides an account for the causal interface between human mentality and the orders of, uh, of creation. Coupled with Jung's understanding of the spirit as divine wisdom, foundational pneumatology as a full-blown general epistemology opens door to pneumatological rationality, rationality referenced from and directed towards the Holy Spirit. If we acknowledge the spirit as the thirdness, the interpreter of all creation and the divine wisdom, the source of rationality, then pneumatological imagination is the moment in which the Holy Spirit illumines human minds. It is a process in which the spirit illuminates our experiences, which in turn reveal to us more about who the spirit is. Indeed, Jung often describes pneumatological imagination as the rationality of quest, of an ongoing inquiry which is legitimized by the very relational, rational and dynamic character of the Trinity itself. These motives are also proceeding from Jung's appropriation of Peirce's logic of abduction. Peirce proposed that abduction, deduction and induction are complementary and assuming each other. Uh, as Professor McGrath, uh, who will be speaking this afternoon, helpfully explains in his, in his uh, 2018, I think, book on, on the rationalities, in Pierce's thought, discovery begins with abduction, in which some hypothesis is formulated to explain some problem. Next comes deduction, which, in which this hypothesis is rendered precise and predictions are deduced. And finally, induction, in which the, the hypothesis is tested by experience. This is precisely because firstness, God, is abducted, secondness, son, is known as deduction of firstness, and then experientially tested in induction, which is work of the spirit. Well, but abduction for Pierce, as well as for Young, is not just inference of something, uh, as we sometimes read in the popular definition, definitions of this term. It is rather a process of imaginative generation, a creative and corrugable process, which often consists of an act of insight that comes to us like a flesh. Pierce's idea of abduction, a creative, imaginative, insightful experience, inference, shares great conceptual overlap with Jung's idea of pneumatic imagination. Jung's approach, however, stems from and proceeds toward pneumatic actuality, towards the actual work of the spirit in this world. Because, after all, how do we know that pneumatological rationality reflects more than categories of thought? Does it ever get hold of reality? I mean, this perhaps is, uh, is also a question for philosophers. Does philosophy ever get hold of, re on, uh, of reality? Uh, does it even want to get hold of reality? Of everyday human situation? Or is it a mere philosophical sophistication? This question may be asked of pneumatological imagination. We know that it does. Because pneumatological rationality claims to be radically particular, arising out of the experience of the spirit. In spite of the philosophical jargon and interaction with a wide array of philosophical thought, Jung's aim from the start till the end is to describe pneumatic actuality, the actual work of the Holy Spirit in this world, which is ubiquitous, although to various degrees and in various modes. All human life and experience is, in Jung's vision, dependent only on the prevenient presence and activity of God through the Holy Spirit. 
Now, this assertion has two important implications, at least uh, within Jung's um, framework of thought. Firstly, and most importantly, uh, the universal scope of pervenient work of the spirit prompts Jung to be alert for experiences of the spirit even outside the Christian context, specifically in other religions and in natural sciences. Now, time constraints will preclude us to fully dive into these areas, it will be for another series of papers like this, but it should be noted, and you must know that this is where actually Jung started. In, in, in his dissertation, he proposed to overcome the Christological impasse in the theology of religions. With what? With pneumatological approach, which doesn't shy away from, uh, from mm. pondering the possibility that, there, that the spirit may be active in other religions as well. And similarly, in dialogue with natural sciences, uh, if, if, if the only way of knowing reality is through the mediator, the Holy Spirit, who mediates us the creation, the firstness, uh, then what natural scientist actually does is that he uh, explores the divine breath, the Holy Spirit, as he chooses to um, make himself known in the natural world, world. On the other hand, secondly, uh, now following the rails of classical Wesleyan Pentecostal spiritual theology, if, preven if prevenient presence of the spirit warrants encounter with reality, then conversion experience makes this encounter, encounter sharper and Pentecostal experience makes it even more intense. Jung himself writes, Living in the world by way of a pneumatological imagination simply means participating in the fields of force generated by the spirit's presence and activity. We do not own the spirit, but simply comply with what the spirit is doing in the world. The Pentecostal charismatic experience of the spirit is thus a vivid and intensified form of this encounter and cooperation, because it grasps the, uh, the individual in the totality of his or her being and moves that person into a public force field, even while the field, the larger world, is effectively transformed by the newly located presence of, of the spirit-filled individual. This is, in my opinion, why the focal point of Jung's foundationalism is not Christian conversion, as with Jalpe, but it is rather a pneumatological imagination, a way of seeing God, self and world that is inspired by the Pentecostal charismatic experience of the Spirit. The underlying or even subconscious reason for Jung's turn from Christology to pneumatology may simply be in his firm conviction that subsequent experience of the Spirit, subsequent, is necessary for a whole Christian life. Now, let, let us be reminded uh, on this place that uh, Jung was raised in classical Pentecostal missionary circles that are soaked, as I can myself confirm, with vigorous propagation on, and practice of the doctrine of subsequence, of the doctrine which says that the Spirit comes uh, and it fills the person after his conversion, not only as a part of his conversion. For Jung, charismatic experience and charismatic life continuously shape the pneumatological imagination and vice versa. Charisms, however, are not exclusive to Pentecostals, but can be manifest in any human being open to the spirit regardless of their religious affiliation. Here I suspect that some conservative circles may not be very happy about this statement. Jung makes distinction between Christ's presence, which focuses on the past act of salvation, and Spirit's presence, which points toward empowered witness and to the eschaton. Pneumatological imagination then strives to remain in the presence force field, to use Jung's term, uh, of the spirit, while it is at the same time sensitive to discern spirit's absence, which is the demon. This very particular notion of spirit's activity 
prompt us to speak of pneumatic imagination as that which pertains to the actual activity of the spirit rather than pneumatological, which is Jung's original term, uh, because pneumatological relates to pneumatology as a uh, potentially theoretical enterprise, but Jung's pneumatological imagination is no theory, it is very, very, very active and uh, active way of living life and knowing the world uh, in cooperation and through the activity of the Holy Spirit in this world. This also points towards an important feature of pneumatic imagination, which is its visionary and prescriptive rather than merely descriptive character and function. Pneumatological imagination is first and foremost a world-making and works envisioning activity. It is this theological imagination which brings tolerance to truthful inquiry interpretation of revelatory data processed by the imagination, by participation on the spirit's breath. Just as Pentecostal charismatic experience of the spirit stems from and at the same time shapes pneumatic imagination, uh, which is participation on the spirit in the world, so does pneumatic imagination invite individuals to participate on spirit's mission, to actively discern wage spiritual wars, do acts of justice and reconciliation, and herald God's kingdom. This very quest for truth has transformative power. According to Pierce, his source, Young's source to, to, to a large extent, according to Pierce, Beliefs emerge from thinking that proceeds inferentially from perceptual judgments and perceptual facts and concludes with the establishment of habits of action related to the object of belief. The result of this process in Piercean theory of truth is existential transformation. Existential transformation as the result uh, of, uh, of, uh, of of process of knowing. Now, this could easily remind us of John 8.32. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Truth is therefore personal rather than abstract. It is ethical rather than totalistic. Truth is that which is transformative and directive toward eschatological fulfillment. Now, uh, trying to assess, to evaluate Jung's uh, project uh, is not easy for me and it's not easy for a Pentecostal theologian uh, because uh, despite its novelty, as I said, uh, despite uh, his particular conclusions and applications of the, his theory, uh, it is in fundamental accord with theological grammar, to, to use uh, the term of George Lindbeck, theological grammar of Pentecostal movement. Jung's epistemology is exclusively theistic and radically continualistic, which is appealing uh, to a growing number of Pentecostal and renewal theologians, Bible scholars, etc. It affirms spirit's indispensable role in the very process of knowledge, which quite amusingly affirms and successfully defends one of the most controversial hallmarks of grassroots Pentecostalism, which is its dependence uh, on the Holy Spirit in cognitive processes. Now, uh, how might uh, an average grassroots Pentecostal youth worker respond when you invite him to pursue, for example, uh, seminary education at the uh, uh, and it's, it's a splendid institution such as this. How, how might she reply? Well, I don't need such education because the Spirit will guide me into all the truth. Which I read in John 16, 13. Now, Jung would admit this, albeit he would never use such a vulgar exegesis of John 16, 13. But he sees it from both sides. He would say, just as the Spirit will guide you into all the truth, so all the truth will guide you into the Spirit. 
experience of the spirit makes you more fit to grasp the full spectrum of experiential empirical reality in this world. At the same time, reality of this world, including natural sciences, other religions and full scope of experience, makes you fit to experience the spirit better. Of course, there might be any number uh, of points of criticism. Uh, some of them might be briefly mentioned. Uh, one, critical questions, qu uh, one critical question may object uh, to the intersection of uh, metaphysics and spiritual realm. Can a philosophical theology really describe spiritual experience? This is a very important and painstaking question. Another question, is Jung's vision of pneumatic imagination real or is it merely utopist? This is perhaps a question raised among Pentecostals themselves because um, Jung's ideal Pentecostal community seems to bear little resemblance to the concrete reality of the movement. However, if we bracket out these questions and some more, if we bracket out these questions and if we, even if we don't share Pentecostal commitments, uh, philosoph or philosophical inclinations of Jung, his pneumatological imagination is an ideal tool for engaging the other. The war on terrorism, migration crisis, endless cultural wars, COVID pandemic, rise of populism and socialist bureaucracy, and most recently the war in Ukraine clearly demonstrates the, the need to truly embrace and grace in the other. Now, pneumatic imagination humbly recognizes that the spirit, as the source of rationality, blows where she chooses, not excluding the other, no matter how distant. Here, my presentation should end. I hope that it is clear by now that Jung's work, uh, work is, in its essence, a compact and versatile epistemological theory, which makes experience of the spirit and his whereabouts in this world central to human cognition. So let the spirit uh, guide us into all truth that we all desire because it is the spirit of truth who will set us free from the bondage of our, of our ignorance. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm looking forward to your, to your questions. We have only scrambled the surface of the massive project and many words that might be said about Young, but I hope that it has stimulated your your appetite this morning. Um, thank you very much for this.